In the early days of the message of the Infinite Way, I'm sure that when I came to Seattle, there were many students who felt that, well, here is a teacher who knows a lot of truth. I don't know whether I ever told them that that wasn't so. I was a student like they were. But by now, they should have discovered that because right here in Seattle, we received such messages as love and gratitude, I am the vine, the third part of the book, Thunder of Silence, deep silence of my peace, oh, many, many, many of the principles that are now incorporated in the writings of the Infinite Way were given to me as I stood on the platform speaking, or sat at the table speaking. They were given to me and then were incorporated into the writings. Had I known them before that, they would have been in the writings before that. Throughout the entire Infinite Way experience, that is what has happened. It wasn't that I knew any truth at all when I began to teach. I had received the Spirit of God, and it was working in me and through me and healing. And then finally I was asked to come here, there, and the other place to teach. But I had nothing to teach. I had only the Spirit of God that was working in me. And then as I began to address classes and lectures, the message began to flow. And then we copied them down on tape recorders and wire recorders in those days, sometimes even uh, stenographic notes. All of spiritual interpretation was taken down by three girls in uh, shorthand and then given to me at the end of 60 weeks and I just edited them and put them in a book. Had I known those principles before the class began, I would have had the book to begin with. And so it has been that in teaching I have been taught And the reason is that I learned, even as a practitioner, when I didn't know what truth was and yet was healing, I learned never to depend on yesterday's manner. Forget about yesterday's manner. When you're called on to heal, sit down and turn to the spirit within and let it provide fresh manna. Some truth may have come to you yesterday that healed a very serious illness. And if you try to repeat that truth with your mind today, it might not even relieve a tiny headache. Why? Because there is no power in a statement of truth. The power is in the consciousness behind the statement. The power is in the consciousness behind the statement. The power is not in the statement. And that is why many metaphysicians memorize passages and then believe that by repeating those passages, there is power in them. There is some power, the power that you give them in belief. Certainly, as you have known, people have taken an aspirin tablet and believed they were healed of consumption with it. Other people have taken a hypodermic injection of plain water and their pain stopped immediately if they had enough faith in the doctor. And so it is that if you can have enough faith in a statement of truth, it may do something for you, not because it had power, 
because your faith gave it power. But ordinarily speaking, we really should not have faith in statements of truth, but in the consciousness from which the statements came. In other words, the Master gave us so clearly that I and the Father are one. Now, how many times do you think that statement has been repeated in the churches around the world? And if that statement had any power, we would all be in heaven. Or, the Master has made the statement, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Well, do you know the amount of times that has been repeated and read in Scripture? Nobody should have a guilt complex in the whole world. Yet you know it isn't true, that statement hardly ever relieved anyone of their fear of punishment or their guilt complex. In other words, it isn't the statement that frees anybody. It is the consciousness of the Christ which came through Jesus. And so it is that if the statements of truth in the Bible or in my writings or in the writings of any of the authentic metaphysicians, and there are several authentic metaphysicians, Mrs. Eddy, Dr. Holmes, Mrs. Fillmore, if there was any power in their statements, there, is eno there are enough statements in the world to heal the world so that we wouldn't really need any teachers or practitioners. But you see, the power is not in those books the power is not in those statements. The power is in the consciousness through which those statements came. And so it is today that when a teacher or practitioner says to a student or patient, fear not, God is with you, don't turn around and take hold of the statement and believe that it has power to do something, especially if you repeat it a hundred times. Because that is not where the power lies. The power lies in the consciousness of the teacher or the practitioner making that statement. Now, in the same way, <coughs> in these 17 years of the message of the infinite way, we now have a great many helps for students in the form of about 24 books published in the United States and 15 or more pamphlets, about 27 books published in uh, the British Empire, British Commonwealth. Many, many of the books published in German, French, Dutch, Japanese. In addition to that, we have a monthly letter published in Hawaii for the United States, Canada, and South America. And that same letter is photographed in London and published and distributed throughout the entire British Commonwealth and the continent of Europe and South Africa. And again, it is printed in Germany in German. And next year, it begins publication in French. In addition to that, we have a monthly letter published primarily for parents, grandparents, and uh, teenagers, which is published in Canada. And in addition to that, we have a 17-week study course, which is now being published out of New York City. All of this is available to our students, to those who desire them. But now let us understand for what purpose they are available. 
They are not presented to you with the statement that, now you buy these or borrow these and uh, you will be taken into heaven or they will heal your sins or diseases or lacks. No, no, no. They are presented to you for study and practice so that your consciousness may be developed spiritually. When your consciousness is spiritually developed, then your consciousness becomes a healing consciousness, a feeding consciousness, a comforting consciousness, a forgiving consciousness. Each of us must in turn develop or have our consciousness developed and specific principles help us in that way, specific studies. The greatest power revealed to me is the power of meditation. But you see, meditation is very difficult to achieve. And for the Western world, it is almost impossible. Up until the message of the infinite way, there was very little material available on the subject of meditation because the subject wasn't understood in the Western world and the method of developing it wasn't understood and therefore those who undertake it now find they are on strange ground. Ah, but when I explain to you in person or through practicing the presence or the art of meditation or the world is new. When I explain to you that meditation acts in this way, and I'm going to explain it now, you will soon see that meditation becomes simple and eventually possible. Now here is the foundation for the meditation that eventually will give you spiritual consciousness, the mind that was in Christ Jesus, the healing consciousness, the feeding, the supplying consciousness, the forgiving and the comforting consciousness. It has its basis in the statement that I and the Father are one. Now let us understand that statement. You must, you must understand. Blind faith will not help you. You must understand. You cannot insult your own intelligence by making statements that your intellect can't respond to. So when we say, I and the Father are one, let us understand what this means. It means there is someone called I, Joel, I, Bill, I, Mary, I, Joel, and of him the Master said, you can of your own self do nothing. If you speak of yourself, you bear witness to a lie. You are nothing. Uh-huh. All right. So, Joel, you are nothing of yourself. But go on from there. Ah, but I, God, and I, Joel, are one. And if I, Joel, look unto I, God, the Father, not up in heaven, not in holy mountains, not in holy temples, but closer to you than breathing within you. Ah, now I close my eyes and I say, just think. I, the Father, God, and I, the Son, Joel, am one. Here where I am, the very place whereon I stand as holy ground, because I, Joel, the Son, and I, God, the Father, are one, and you cannot 
separate us. Neither life nor death can separate I, God, from I, Joel. And just think, heretofore, I have been looking out here to persons, to conditions, to governments, to bomb-proof shelters, to bank accounts. And here all of the time, right here within me, I, Joel, am one with the Father. And just think, God says, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Can you imagine that all that God has belongs to Joel? Joel has access to all that the Father hath through that promise. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and Joel, all that I have is thine. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Joel, you have access to infinite good, to the infinite storehouse of good. What has the Father then for you, Joel? Well, God is spirit. Therefore, the Spirit of God is yours. God is love. Then God's love is yours. God is life eternal. Then, Joel, you have immortal, eternal life. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Then, Joel, you have the whole earth and the fullness thereof. My peace give I unto thee, white Joel. You have access to all of God's peace. My grace is thy sufficiency, white Joel. You have access to all of God's grace. Just think, sitting here in this moment of quiet and of peace, I acknowledge God and my oneness with God. I acknowledge God's love, God's life, God's peace, God's grace, God's abundance as mine. All that the Father hath is mine. And as I continue to read spiritual, mystical writings, I discover that I, God, will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That if uh, Joel mounts up to heaven, he will find I, God, there. And if Joel so far forgets himself as to drop in some kind of a hell and just remembers to look up, he will find I, God, there. And if by any chance Joel should find himself walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he need only look up and find I, God, there. Why? Because I, God, and I, the son, Joel, are one. Inseparable, indivisible, one. Am I not being a bit greedy? Am I not depriving my neighbor of some of God? No, because God is spirit. God is not a material thing that can be divided up into house lots or bank accounts. The infinite spiritual nature of God is infinitely spiritually one with every individual on the face of the globe. You know, it has been said that you could get a hundred thousand angels on the point of a pin. And so it is, you can get the allness of God 
the immortality of God in my individual life. You can have the infinite wealth of God in my individual life, but then God doesn't divide, God multiplies. Did you notice that in the experience of Jesus? He didn't divide God's abundance, the few loaves and fishes among the multitude. He multiplied it. So it is. God doesn't divide or subtract, but multiplies. And the infinity that is mine is multiplied as the infinity of yours, so that we each have the allness of God because God is spirit. Only if you think in material terms of God or God's grace would you be tempted to think that it's divided. But the moment you think of God as spirit or God as life or God as love, then you can realize well, even by the example in your garden. Let us suppose that out in your garden you have 12 species of flowers and of half a dozen trees. Each of them has the allness. They do not divide up the life of God among them. They do not divide up the rain and the sunshine. They each have all. So it is. I and my Father are one, and that which I have been indulging these last moments we call a contemplative meditation, because we are contemplating truth, contemplating God and the things of God and the laws of God and the omnipresence of God and the omnipotence of God and the omniscience of God. Just think. All of God's wisdom is here where I am and is available to me. And therefore, I need take no thought for my life. Just abide here in quietness and in confidence in the realization that the omniscience, the all-knowingness of God, the all-wisdom of God, which knoweth my need, is likewise providing it providing for it. As I sit here, I do not have to use any power. We are definitely taught not by might, nor by power. I do not have to use any spiritual power or any mental power. Why? Because God is omnipotence, the all power. Therefore, I sit here quietly, peacefully, and let the all power of God manifest itself in me, through me. Just let God's power flow. I do not use any power ever. In fact, I'm never aware of any power. I don't have any feeling of any power. I merely have the feeling of sitting here quietly contemplating the presence of God within me, omnipresence, contemplating the omnipotence of God, the all power of God, contemplating the omniscience of God, the all knowingness of God, and then being satisfied just to sit here in this communion. And I can contemplate the grace of God. Thy grace is my sufficiency in all things. I can contemplate the love of God. I can look out at nature and see how the buds and blossoms right now are beginning to form. And, of course, knowing that only in a few weeks the fruit will be there and the berries. And so I can contemplate God's love. And all of this is mine. Not because I of myself am anything, but because I and the Father are one. And in this oneness is my allness. In the conscious realization of this oneness is my allness. 
all that the Father hath is mine. And of course, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Therefore, the earth and the fullness thereof is mine and thine. If I am consciously aware of it, it comes through in manifestation. If you continue to remain in ignorance of your oneness with the Father and of your relationship to the Father and of your Father's grace and omnipresence and omnipotence and omniscience, it will be as if it weren't there. And then you will say, why do you have so much and I so little? And the difference is in conscious knowledge. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But first, you must know the truth. And so we have this period of contemplative meditation. And in it, I contemplate God and the things of God and the glory of God and the grace of God. I acknowledge God in all my ways. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Now how can you acquaint yourself with God except enter into the stillness and invite God to reveal himself to you. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I will listen for thy voice. I and the Father are one, but the Father is greater than I. Therefore, I am always the servant of the Most High, always obedient to the directions that come from within. And so you see, then, that our writings our instructions, our letters, all of these are lessons. They're not power. They don't promise you life, truth, and love. They don't promise you health, wealth, and happiness. They are the instructions that you take into your consciousness and with which you work they are the principles that have been revealed to us in all of this classwork. They are the principles that our students are proving in all parts of the world that has made this message spread. And as you work with them, you develop your consciousness. Now, there are two worlds. There is the real world, the spiritual world, and there is the world of concepts. And we were born into the world of concepts so that we were born into a world of two powers, some powers good and some powers evil, some people good and some people evil, some powers that cause disease and some powers that cure disease, some powers that uh, cause sin and some that heal sin. But you see, that is all make-believe. That is a world of mythology. That is a world of uh, accepted belief. It isn't real and it isn't true. For instance, you yourself know how many years you have believed that if you got your feet wet outdoors or if you sat in a draft indoors that the general result would be that you would catch cold. Now, not only you believed that and the doctors believed that and their medicines were all based on that belief. And we actually suffered many times because of it. But you know, since December, 
the doctors have acknowledged that that's all an old wives' tale. And they published in the Reader's Digest, you mustn't believe that anymore. That never was true. You cannot catch a cold by sitting in a draft, and you cannot catch cold by getting your feet wet. That's an old wives' tale, just mythology. Oh, but how you and I have suffered from that mythology. It's a world of make-believe, and because somebody with authority made it up, as a rule, we accept it and suffered by it. Many, many years ago, our mental institutes were just filled with women suffering from menopause. There's none there now for that reason, because the doctors have agreed now that menopause doesn't cause insanity. But don't forget that in your parents' or grandparents' day, they did. And they just filled our institutions with people. Why? It was believed. It was a world of make-believe. And they made the rules and we lived up to them. But it wasn't truth. Because now they've done away with it. So it is that someday you will discover that all of the causes for disease will be wiped out. All of them. Just like... In the days of early metaphysics, you may remember the lists that were published showing mental causes for physical disease. Well, you know, not one of them was true. It never has been true that uh, resentment caused rheumatism or that deep resentment caused hemorrhoids or that lust called tuberculosis, caused tuberculosis. That never was true. Those lists were just as much fiction as the belief that you could catch a cold by sitting in a draft or getting your feet wet. It didn't prevent you suffering from it. No, 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 as long as you could be made to accept it. But today, today we know that disease has no cause. Today we know there is no such thing as a law of disease. Why? If there were a law of disease, the disease would be permanent because the law would maintain it. There is a law of two times two begetting four. And because of that, you never can change the fourness of two times two. There is a law. If, there, if that wasn't a law, you might sometimes get something other than four. But because it is a law, you'll always have two times two producing four. Now, if there were a law of disease, who could cure it? Who could set aside law? But you see, only through meditation does a revelation come from within. Well, in the month of March, one of the greatest scientists one of the great scientists, at least, in this country, gave a paper before a scientific body, and it was reprinted in Harper's Magazine, in which he revealed that this body has no intelligence, that this body is made up of a cup of water and a few grains of minerals and salts. And there isn't a bit of life or intelligence in this body. So there's no way for this body to get sick or well. It has no intelligence. It's dead. So you see, that which we have known and received through spiritual inspiration for years, the world is beginning to realize today. A cold can't be caused by sitting in a dram or wet feet. The body cannot contract the disease because it has no intelligence. If you're going to be diseased, you'll have to be diseased by accepting something in your mind. Now, if you can accept that a germ will give you a disease, you can be diseased. But if you can't accept it, then you can't be diseased. How do you think germ diseases are spiritually healed if germs could really cause disease? If they could really cause disease, everybody that got a germ disease would have it, and it would have to be removed medically. How could you spiritually stop a germ disease? And yet, probably there isn't anyone in this room 
who hasn't at some time or other been healed of some germ disease. Spiritually. How? Because God never made a destructive element. There are germs, of course there are. But do you think for a moment that God created a destructive germ? Do you think that God created a germ that would kill his own creation? You're making God less intelligent than a human parent. What human parent in their normal mind would create something to destroy their own children with? No. God never created any condition that would destroy his creation. God never created any element, any substance, that would destroy his creation. And therefore, if God didn't make it, it wasn't made, because God is the only creator. How many of you have been healed at some time or other of poison ivy or poison oak? Metaphysically, spiritually. How? Not by applying physical remedies, but through your realization or your practitioner or teacher's realization that God is spirit and all power is in spirit, not in matter. How many years has the world believed that there is such a thing as matter? And how much ridicule do you think Mrs. Eddy took for her revelation that there is no such thing as matter, that matter has no existence? And now how shocked the world must be when Dr. Von Braun, the greatest of the great, announces publicly in an article, there is no matter. What you call matter is mind. Think, think, think that it's nearly a hundred years ago that that was revealed to us that there is no matter, all is mind. And mind's manifestation. And oh, how that was ridiculed. All the books that have been written ridiculing that statement. Until now it becomes a scientific revelation that what you call matter is mind formed, manifested, that the substance of matter is mind. Just think, just think now that the reason truth heals is the truth taken into your consciousness it becomes the substance of your body. The truth that's taken into your mind becomes the substance of your body. Do you wonder that the Master said, I am the truth, and that this body is the temple of the living God? And so you see, books do not heal you. Books are not the power. The truth that these books give to you to take into your consciousness, the studying that you do with the books until your consciousness is no longer a material state of consciousness, but a spiritual consciousness. Until you have made the transition from believing in the reality of matter to where you attain the consciousness that spirit is the only reality. Spirit is the substance of your soul, of your mind, and of your body. We still go a step beyond what Dr. Von Braun has experienced because we know that mind is only a step. There is something beyond the mind, and that is the soul or spirit. We know that man is not two-dimensional. He's not mind and body. He's three-dimensional. Spirit, mind, and body. And that is why we have gone beyond the first metaphysical teaching where mind and thought were power to where we know now that mind and thought are not power. I am power. I, in my oneness with God, am power. 
and that power which I am becomes the harmony of my mind and body. You see, mind is an instrument and a substance. But mind can be good or evil. It can produce good thoughts or bad thoughts, and it can produce a healthy body or a diseased body, an alive body or a dead body. Why? Because it is merely an instrument. And so whatever you pour into the mind is going to come out in the body. And if you pour evil into the mind, well, you know it. You've witnessed it. You're probably worrying about it with your children or your grandchildren, all the pornography that's sown, sold on the newsstand. You don't want that poured into your child's mind. Why? Because it's going to have an effect on their body, and you know it. So that the mind can be an instrument for good or evil. The mind isn't God and never was. That was the first revelation that was given to me that separated me from the metaphysical world. Long before I left physically that world, that revelation was given to me that mind is not God, because mind can be good or bad, and it can be used for... Ah, it can be used. Who uses the mind? I do. And if I use it as a human being, I can use it for good or evil, but if I use it as God, it can only be used for spiritual, beneficial, uplifting purposes. Therefore, I and my Father being one... All of God's grace flows in and through me and purifies my mind and my body. And thereafter, my mind cannot be used as an instrument for evil because I have surrendered my mind to the oneness of I and the Father. And now all that comes through my mind is what comes from the Father. I do not think my own thoughts, and therefore I do not have good thoughts or bad thoughts. But I surrender myself to the Father and only spiritual thoughts come through. I do not have mental powers or physical powers. I am no miracle worker. I have no powers. I surrender myself in meditation to the Spirit of God, to my oneness with the Father. And then the spiritual flower, power flows and miracles take place. But I'm not the miracle man. I'm only the transparency through which the miracles took place. It was God's power that is the miracle. It absolutely takes from us all egotism, all belief. It's like the Master taught, Why callest thou me good? There is really only one good, the Father. Don't look on these works of the Master as if he were a miracle worker. No, I am my own self, I'm nothing. He just stood there, and in the knowledge and the understanding of his oneness with the Father, he let the Father work through him. So do we in this message. We do not use right thinking or wrong thinking. We do not use the power of right thinking or wrong thinking. We understand that I, in my oneness with the Father, am joint heir to all of God's grace, and then in quietness and in stillness, let it flow. So then, as we take these truths into our consciousness, these truths become the substance of our lives, the bread, the meat, the wine, the water. And then, this constitutes a rebirth. Whereas before I was Joel, the man, sometimes thinking good and sometimes thinking bad, sometimes feeling good and sometimes feeling bad. Now I make the transition and I and the Father are one. And the Father doeth the works. The Father thinketh the thoughts. The Father is the power. The Father goeth before me to make the crooked places straight. In these years, all of these principles that have revealed themselves to me and those that are revealing themselves now, 
are given to our students so that they may work with them. We had the most marvelous experience in Portland. A principle was revealed to me that never before have I known. On the platform, while I was conducting the class, this new principle came through. And I may say to you that it's a miracle working one, for I've already witnessed its marvels. And that principle was this. Well, we start with me. I'm sitting up here. You are looking at me. Whether or not you know it at this moment, <clears throat> I would not want you to judge me by the way I appear. I would not want you to judge me as to whether I'm old or young. I would not want you to judge me as to whether I'm honest or dishonest. I would not want you to judge me by any measure of judgment that you can think. And if there are some good psychologists out there who uh, automatically know uh, an individual when they look at them, please stop looking. I, I would not want to be judged that way. If I could have my way, I would have you look up here and behold the Son of God in me, and see me as I am seen by the Father. Know me as my Father knows me, as God knows me. See my spiritual identity. Do you remember how the Master said, Who do men say that I am? And then, Whom do ye say that I am? That's the way I'd like to be judged the way Peter judged the Master and said, Oh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, all those without spiritual vision would have said, Oh, you're a Hebrew rabbi. Of course, he had the Hebrew rabbi's robe on. He was preaching in the Hebrew temple. So that's the way you judge him, judging through your uh, mentality. But he didn't want to be judged that way, and so he said to the disciples, Whom do ye you who have been with me, you who ought to know me, whom do you say that I am? And Peter could say, I know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so, rather than to be judged by what men would say I am, I would rather, if I could, that you, turning within yourselves, would say to the Father within you, Who is this fellow? because I know what the answer would be. If you turned within to the Father, the Father would say, Know ye not this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's what I would like. Well, so it is. When you come to me as a patient or a student, because of my years of spiritual experience, I really don't look at you as if you're a male or a female. I don't look at you as if you're young or old. I don't look at you as if you're rich or poor or occupy a high place or a low place. That's really of no interest to me in my spiritual capacity. When you come to me as a patient or a student, I'm looking through your eyes because I've learned that you, the soul of you, sits behind those eyes. You may have a false face out here in the flesh, but you have no false face back there. And as long as I can see through your eyes, I can see the soul of you sitting back there. And be assured, I have worked in the prisons where there was every evidence of sin, and I have beheld the real man sitting back there and have witnessed wonders with them because of that. Not by trying to reform them humanly, not by telling them they were poor, downtrodden men who never had a chance, but by seeing through their eyes into, I know thee who thou art. Back there sits the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you. And you know, one of my most joyous moments is when I can tell you that on the 9th of April, 
the Orthodox religious church had the greatest day that it has known for 20 centuries. The Pope of Rome visited a prison in Rome, and he said to the men, I am not here for any reason of romance nor humanitarianism. I am here because I behold Christ incarnate in you. Can you imagine what that did to some of those men? To be told they weren't sinners, that they weren't condemned to hell forever, that someone in the world saw Christ incarnate in them. And I'll tell you why it did it to them, because it will do it to you. There isn't any one of you who doesn't know that you are spiritually perfect, the Son of God, that if anyone could know you as you really are, they'd find that you are really a perfect being. You know that. But you know that nobody out here is judging you that way or seeing you that way. And as a rule, you're resenting what your friends and relatives see in you because they're not seeing you as you are. Even the worst sinner among you knows that you really aren't that way at all, even if you're indulging it at the moment. Every one of you knows inwardly that you're perfect. But you see, that doesn't help you a great deal. What helps you is if one individual could come along and say, take off that mask. I know you. I see that Christ lurking behind your eyes. I see the face of God in you. That would so change your nature that your whole character would change, your whole outer disposition would change, and eventually your health would change. Just one individual beholding the Christ behind your eyes, recognizing your spiritual sonship, your separateness from these material and mental laws. Well, you see, you might lie, if you like, and go home and say to your family, oh, I behold the Christ in you, but you don't really, just pretending. You cannot do that until your own spiritual consciousness is so developed that you really can see Christ incarnate. It takes a developed, a spiritually developed soul. The psychologist can see you as you humanly are. The members of your family can see you as you appear to be among them. But only the developed spiritual consciousness will enable you to look at any and every individual in the world and say, ah, I behold Christ incarnate in you. When that moment happens, you are a healer, and you are a spiritual teacher, and not before. Before that time, you merely know all the words in the books. Before that time, you merely have it intellectually grasped. But you're not really a healer or a teacher until an actual experience makes it possible for you to say, I see Christ incarnate in every individual, the good ones and the bad ones, the ups and the downs. Don't you remember how Jesus had to see it in the woman taken in adultery? And believe me, that was difficult because adultery then wasn't like now. Now it's a little pastime that smiled at. But at that time, it was punishable by death. It was a crime, adultery, a real crime, equal to murder. And yet he could look right into the eyes of the woman taken in adultery and say, neither do I condemn thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. He could behold Christ incarnate and the thief on the cross. Just think of crucifying a man, how terrible his crime must have been. And the master could say, you won't go to purgatory and suffer it out for years. I'm taking you into heaven with me tonight. Why? because I behold Christ in you. I'm taking the Christ of you into heaven tonight because the Christ is already in heaven. You're already in heaven, but I'm going to reveal it to you. 
But he wasn't talking to a criminal. He was talking to Christ. And so when a spiritual teacher or practitioner says to you, you are spiritual or you are the child of God, don't believe for a moment that he means that humanly you are any of those things because humanly you're just an illusion. Humanly you're just a mortal concept that should be dying, not trying to spiritualize itself, should be dying daily. But it's because the spiritual teacher or practitioner has seen through the appearance of your physical body or your mentality and has actually glimpsed the Christ of you. Therefore, the principle that revealed itself to me the other night in Portland was this, that when you come here, you are presenting yourself to me that I may behold the Christ of you. And that every time you ask a practitioner or teacher for help, you are presenting yourself to them that they may behold the I, the Christ of you. You're not going to them to get rid of rheumatism or to stop smoking or drinking. You're not presenting yourself to them to get healed of a disease. You are virtually saying, please look at me. Look at me and behold the Christ incarnate in me. I long to be seen as I am in the image and likeness of my Father, as God sees me. And if you will see me that way, I will be made whole. So you see that even after 35 years, it's folly to think you know all the truth there is. Just watch out that you don't ever get the feeling you know all the truth there is because you don't. As much as we know, it's a grain. And every day we can add and learn new principles because God is infinite. Therefore, never think that we've seen the whole of God. Now we're going to have five or six, seven minutes of a rest period, and I would like to ask you that in your conversation, keep the voice low. Let us be gentle, let us be quiet, and then if any of you have any books you'd like me to autograph for you, just bring them up here. Thank you.